bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds in the Canadian franchise industry. This is the Franchise Canada Chats podcast. Welcome to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast, where we take you into the world of franchising. Our interviews are with franchisees, franchisors, and industry leaders who give on the pulse expert advice and share their franchising insights and experiences. I'm your host, Stephanie. This is season four, episode seven of the spring season. In this episode, I talk to Clark Harrop, a partner at Dale and Lessman LLP. The business law firm is a franchise support service supplier that represents franchisors and franchisees in the franchise agreement and disclosure document process. Clark has been in the franchising space since the year 2000 and has worked with brands including Tim Hortons and McDonald's, where he says he learned how good franchise systems work and adapt to changes as necessary. Here, Clark shares why he decided to take his decades of franchise experience to a private practice to work more closely with franchisors and franchisees, how to best implement system change within a franchise system, including the challenges this poses for franchisors, and the importance of communication between franchisors and their franchisees, especially as we continue to face the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Enjoy the episode. So first question is, can you tell me about your background and what brought you to Dale and Lessman LLP? Well, thanks, Stephanie. I joined Dale and Lessman a little over two years ago. And after a very long career in, in franchising, I've been in the franchising space since, since 2000 when I joined Tim Hortons. But I had spent most of my career um, in-house in a variety of legal and business roles with Tim Hortons and McDonald's. And you know, a number of years ago, as I was plotting and thinking about what, what my next move was mm-hmm. uh, and what I wanted to do in an industry that has been very good to me and that I have really just fell in love with since I've been, uh, since I've been working in the franchising space. I decided that I wanted to take kind of, I'm going to say a bold and unconventional thing. I wanted to take all the experience and knowledge that I developed working for a couple of the best known franchise brands in the entire world. And I want to take that back to private practice because I wanted the opportunity to work with, uh, I wanted to work with smaller entrepreneurial uh, startups. I wanted to lead with franchise organizations that were right on the cusp of being ready to grow, that were ready to, you know, ready to take on the world. And where my experience with a couple of, I'm going to say the big guys would be particularly uh, valuable for those organizations that had all the right pieces in place, but maybe were looking for some strategic guidance around franchising strategy and how to set themselves up from a legal standpoint to really take advantage of the opportunities that lay in front of them. So that idea of working with entrepreneurs, with founder-led organizations, with people who were really passionate about franchising and passionate uh, and ambitious about their growth was super exciting to me. And so that that led me back to private practice and it led me to join Dale & Lussman, which is a, uh, I'm going to say a mid-sized commercial boutique firm with about 25 lawyers, 70 support uh, 70 people total. And, and we really focus on working with those organizations that are founder led and that are ripe for growth, that are looking for legal services and, and, and advisors who are innovative and, uh, and, and entrepreneurial as well. And so the culture of the organization, the culture of Dale and Lessman really appealed to me. Um, I'd known many of the people there for many years and was so uh, grateful for the opportunity to join them. Awesome. So what does Dale and Lessman do to support both franchisees and franchisors? Um, How could you guys help a prospective franchisee who's just getting started? So our practice is, you know, while we act for franchisors and franchisees, most of our clients uh, on the franchisee side are people who are, they they tend to be uh, area developers and master franchisees Mm -hmm. who are purchasing the rights to bring, sometimes it's U.S. and international brands into Canada, or sometimes it's expanding West Coast brands to, uh, to Central Canada. What I like to think is that we provide, we leverage our experience to provide some strategic advice. So when I'm working with, um, you know, with a franchisee, with a master developer who's looking to bring rights in, you know, I can help them assess the market opportunity, help them assess and, and come up with what their, you know, their real estate development strategy is going to be, what their franchising strategy is going to be, if they're going to be sub-franchising uh, as a master franchisee. And then obviously on the legal side, I can help them set up their corporate structure, assist them with their tax and business planning, 
And as I would with, with the franchise or clients, you know, also take a look at, you know, how to structure their organization, how to assist them with hiring people and, you know, building up their organization. So really it's, it's, I work in the franchising industry and I worked largely with franchisors and, and, and some franchisees, but I'm not limited to simply providing advice around franchise agreements, mm-hmm. but really almost acting as their outside general counsel, providing them with a range of advice, uh, business and legal advice to assist them in their you know, ambitions for growth. Um, so you previously worked with both Tim Hortons and McDonald's Canada doing various legal and franchising roles. So I'm interested to know what you learned while working with each brand and any advice you can offer to individuals interested in investing with them. Well, what I'll say is that I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to work with both, you know, Mm -hmm. both Tim Hortons and and McDonald's are not just globally recognized as franchise brands, but even within the industry are recognized as some of the, uh, some of the best operators. Um, And I'd had the you know, I had the, the benefit for almost two decades of, of working with real leaders in the industry, you know, people who I admire immensely, you know, people who are, you know, I'm going to say legends within, within franchising and working with that kind of top tier talent, that incredible leadership has certainly taught me a lot about how good franchise systems work. And what I learned at both those organizations, although, although I'm sure that if you spoke to somebody who worked we spent their entire careers at just one, you know, they, they might be kind of shocked to find out that they actually have a lot in common because they're, they're intense, intensely competitive, you know, but the fact is that what makes each of them great is a, is a lot of similar things. And one, you know, one of those things is they have, they have cultures that are very adaptable. Um, they are constantly evolving the brand, constantly trying new products. And the other thing that both those two brands are exceptional at and is something that I learned from is the importance of communication in a franchise system. And that's communication with franchisees, that's communication with suppliers, and that's communication with employees. It's about creating a team first approach where everybody knows where the organization is going. Everyone sort of understands what evolution needs to look like, what competitive pressures are out there and and where we need to go. And so they both take an exceptionally collaborative approach in working with uh, whether it's introducing new products or changing technology, you know, although they are, they're both restaurant franchises, those kind of attributes and those lessons that I learned um, working with some of, those, some of those leaders about the importance of, you know, first having a clear vision and then being able to communicate that clear vision and ensure that all of the franchisees, employees and suppliers are all working towards it is something that has stuck with me. And it's one of the things that I now bring to you know, it's one of the things that I bring to smaller clients who are just starting out on this journey. Awesome. And so you did mention having communication is super important, of course, anywhere you go. But um, what advice can you offer franchisors to create effective communication within their franchise system? Well, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to jump on this podcast, I mean, apart from the fact that I've been a big fan going right back <laughs> to season one is I, I like that idea of, of being able to kind of provide these, these practical nuggets. And I thought long and hard about what I would say. You know, the last year during this period of COVID has taught us, uh, and I've seen so many uh, franchise systems have to turn on a dime, have to immediately change the way they do things, change the way they support their franchisees, change the way they recruit and train people, change their supply chain, change their technology. I mean, people have, I mean, pivot is a word that is, is, is much overused. But the number of organizations that have had to, on a, in a very short period of time, been forced to make a huge amount of change has been utterly miraculous. And I've been you know, so grateful to work with a lot of systems. What I have noticed especially is that you know, while in the early days of the pandemic, the, the needs of the situation just being, it, it was an emergency, you know, meant that you moved fast and there was a risk that you broke things. And I think everyone accepted that, franchisees included. As we start to move out of this this crisis and move towards, you know, what does what does a return to normal look like? What does the new normal look like? What I have started to observe, and in, in speaking with a lot of my clients and some of the systems that I work with, is that some of those changes have started to create irritants within the system, irritants in the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee. And that while everyone was happy to kind of hold hands, work together to address this crisis at the outset, now as people are looking at what these changes mean long-term, they're saying, okay, it's great. I, I, implemented, I implemented delivery. 
and I'm on these apps. But as we move back and I have to, I'm a restaurant, I have to reopen my dining room and I'm going to have labor costs there. I don't yet know what's going to happen. How are you going to make sure that I remain profitable? Or on, you know, on the retail side, it's, I move to curbside, but again, are you going to require me or, or do I have the option of keeping curbside even after I reopen and people are allowed to come into my location again? So these kind of questions are coming up in there. They're starting to be irritants because now that we're sort of planning more long-term and thinking about what it's going to be like in the next couple of years, you know, people start to return back to their old way of thinking, which is what does this change mean for me? Is it good for my business? Am I going to be profitable or more profitable as a result of this? And how is the franchisor going to help me and support me as you know I continue to uh, you know face these 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 evolutions and these changes within the within the marketplace? Uh, and so this is where communication really comes in. Whereas before, I found very early on in the pandemic, people were great about organizing these town hall calls with their franchisees, mm-hmm. and then we sort of got to the fall and people started to drop that a little bit. And some of the communication, you know, dropped down. And so now I'm seeing the, the, those, those irritants bubble up and franchisees are starting to say, well, I haven't heard from you in a while. And, you know, so what does this mean for me long-term? What do you think the long-term view is of, of, our, of, our, of our franchise and our sector? And how are we going to address that? And so I think it's more important than ever that franchise systems and franchisors move away from those ad hoc town hall calls that, you know, every Friday we're going to jump on a call and kind of put back in place, you know, more of a regular system of touch points with their franchisees to make sure that they have effective means of communications. And, and one of the ones that I recommend a lot, especially for, for smaller, um, you know, for smaller systems that, that haven't yet grown to that stage is thinking about a franchisee advisory council and how they can pull together a group of their, their leading franchisees to, you know, make sure that all of the concerns of the franchisees are being bubbled up to the franchise or the franchise or is really hearing what's happening on the ground and also then to make sure that there is great collaboration and discussion between franchisors and franchisees. And, and finally, once decisions are made and plans are put in place, that there is strong communication down to the franchisee organizations and then within those franchisee organizations through to their employees. And um, so that's, that's the conversation I'm having with a lot of clients now is how can I help you uh, improve and, and put in place the foundations of effective communication for the next decade? That's great advice. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. Did you know that Franchise Canada has a newsletter sent twice a month that's packed full of fresh franchise opportunities? With Franchise Canada e-news, you get new content from Franchise Canada magazine, franchisee success stories, industry news about CFA members, educational videos all about franchising, and you can keep up to date on the newest episodes of the Franchise Canada Chats podcast that you're listening to right now. Plus, by subscribing to Franchise Canada e-news, you get a free subscription to Franchise Canada magazine. Subscribe now at FranchiseCanada.online. Now back to the podcast episode you are enjoying. And so also continuing on that communication theme, what about for franchisees? What do you recommend they can do to enhance the communication within their own small business? You know, it's interesting because, you know, franchisees come in all shapes and sizes, and some of them are just... I'm going to say they're natural communicators and they're natural leaders. And that, that may be what attracted them to become franchisees in the first place is that they really thrive in environments where they get to build and motivate teams. But, you know, there's a lot of franchisees that become franchisees. And sometimes it's because the franchise that they're in is very particular to an industry that they're familiar with, that they worked in. So they have all of the hard skills, the technical skills, you know, to thrive in an industry. But what's new to them, new to them is that communication piece. They haven't had to lead and motivate large teams before, you know, so, you know, when I'm working with, with franchisors and franchise systems, I mean, one of the things that, you know, that I, that I suggest to them, and I'm always happy to introduce people, um, you know, when I, when I worked at Tim's and McDonald's, both organizations have, you know, incredible uh, trainers around uh, effective communication, uh, people who would lead seminars and webinars with their, with the franchisee community about how to build those strong teams within those organizations. And so uh, sometimes, you know, it's a matter of like, I'm going to say hooking up, hooking up my clients with these, with these people uh, that I've come across in the course of my career to say, you know, here's, here's someone who can really help you. And they could run a program for your franchisees about, about communicating, or we could do some kind of targeted coaching with those franchisees that you feel are, are, are weaker. And then where I've got uh, master franchisees and franchisees that are my clients, you know, certainly you know, I talk to them about the importance of teams and what are they doing to build a team and to build a succession plan within their team, you know, so that they're ready for growth. They're ready to, 
because you can't really, you know, you can't grow unless you've got the team there to support you. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the starting point is making sure that you're hiring effectively, that you're communicating effectively. You know, that's not my area of expertise, but one of the things that I've, you know, one of the things that I've learned is working within franchisors is that no one person has all the answers. You know, I, I look around at the people that I've uh, had the privilege of working with and I see a thousand people who are, who are smarter and, and better than me in so many ways. And one of the most viable things that I can do is admit that I don't know the answer and admit that I'm not the expert in this area and say, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to this person. Uh, creating that network, that supportive network is probably the, the best thing that I can do to help people when they have those communication problems or those, those problems around training. That's, that's how I can help them move the ball. Great. Can you describe what system change looks like and how you can effectively manage it within a franchise system? So I think, I mean, Let's, let's ignore this, the last 12 months of the pandemic, where people have quite literally had emergency calls with their franchisees on a Friday afternoon to say, we're going to institute, you know, we're going to institute, uh, uh, you know, e-commerce through mm-hmm. Shopify. We're going to go live on Tuesday and everyone better be ready for it. Because uh, that's, that's probably not, that's the worst way to be communicating things is to just, I'm going to say, dumping on people. System change and implementing system change is a multi-step thing. I mean, the, the first thing is you, you really do need to build consensus and there has to be an acknowledged truth in, in the franchise system that there actually is a competitive pressure, that there is a need to evolve and grow and adapt because without first, you know, understanding that there's a need to change, then any change that you try and implement, any evolution, any new product, if you can't explain what, that, what purpose that new product serves, uh, how it's going to fit into the existing portfolio of products that a franchise sells, there's going to be resistance. You know, so the first part is, you know, it, it really being strong in terms of the communication in a system about where a franchise system is today, where the industry is going and where the franchise system needs to go. And if you can get agreement on what the future needs to look like, where that future state needs to be down the road, then it's a lot easier to start to lay out a roadmap to say, and these are the things we're going to need to do to get there. And those systems change could be, we're going to need to change the products or services that we offer. It could be, we're going to change the technological platform and the service model in terms of how we do that. So examples of that would be, you know, we need to go online. We need to have a mobile offering. We need to have a, a better app that we can, uh, so our customers can and our clients can reach us more directly. And whether it's they can arrange to purchase things or they can schedule appointments, you know, we need to do these things. And then there's all the, the systems and processes and the people aspects that support that, right? We're all going to need to, you know, every franchisee organization is going to need to hire a, um, you know, a client service ambassador who is responsible for managing client experience, you know, whatever that, that, that example is. The point is that if you just try and take those things, you know, piece by piece and just sort of not look at them holistically in terms of where they fit into a, a multi-year game plan, a strategy and a roadmap for where you need to go, each one, it's too easy for people to just look back and either say, it doesn't fit with my business. It's not right for me. I don't need that. That's not something that really applies to me. You know, and, and the worst is, and it's, it's, it doesn't improve my business. It doesn't make me more profitable. So I'm not going to invest in it. You know, and that's the worst place to be as a franchise system is, is where you know, there is disagreement amongst the franchisees about where you need to go and what you, what you should be investing in. You know, I, I think if you can start by getting level set on where you need to go. And everyone agrees that investment is necessary, change and evolution is necessary. Well, then you'll have a fruitful discussion. And and yes, you'll get lots of pushback as people start to kind of think about a proposed change and how it's going to impact them and whether it's the best way to implement this. But at least people will be focused on, we're all in agreement that this needs to be done. Let's all now talk about how we get it done. Yeah. And you kind of touched on this, but what are some challenges or difficulties that franchisors may have when it comes to managing system change? Well, with, you know, with, with, I'm going to say with, with all due respect to my, to my franchisor clients, right? Sometimes there is a temptation as a franchisor to simply say, this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, occasionally, very occasionally, that's actually the right approach. Like sometimes franchisees, we'll need to hear the message. You signed on to this system. You know, we decide what the system is and we expect everyone to follow along, but you don't want to lead with that. And sometimes the temptation when you're trying to get something done very, very quickly 
is to, is to start there, is to start with the idea of we're going to do this because I said so. And I, I, I just think that, that ultimately that is, that is a mistake, that the, the strongest systems and the best, most successful systems are ones where everyone has bought into the culture. Everyone is in agreement with where they need to go. And so any disagreements are really just about how fast and exactly how we're going to get there, but everyone's moving in the same place. And so I have had some franchisors who have reached out to me and in discussing whatever change it is that they're implementing or how to do something, how to make a temporary change now permanent, that is maybe not as popular or not universally accepted by the franchisee community. There is that temptation for them to say, well, if I just, if I just put it in my operating manual and I just say that this is the way it has to be done now, is that good enough? You know, and my advice to them is, is often from a legal standpoint, yes, your con, you know, your franchise agreement does allow you to do that. You can impose a standard or specification, but is that what you want to do? And always think about what else are you trying to do or what else are you trying to accomplish this year? Do you need them to buy onto a marketing initiative? Do you want their support for the launch of a new product later this year? Do you, are you looking for people to upgrade their equipment and spend money? If you're looking for them to do that, Pushing through a change right now that's unpopular before, if there's, a, if there's another approach, if there's a way to build consensus first, you could damage that communication, you could damage the relationship, uh, and ultimately you could you know, set yourself back and not be able to achieve some of your other objectives. So that's, that's the thing is like lawyers tend to get asked questions that are very discreet. Can I do this? Or if they have done that, is that allowed or is that not allowed? What business people tend to be much better at is thinking about it in the big picture. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes my role can be to help them think about the bigger picture. Ultimately, they always know what the right answer is because then they sit back and they say, thank you. You're right. Like, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Here's where I'm going to go. So sometimes maybe I even talk myself out of work because, you know, once, once they realize that there is a, there's a better non-legal solution, they, they, they go down that path. Hmm. Interesting. So now let's talk about this COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has urged nearly every franchise system to make strategic changes to their brand. So are there any successful business pivots you've seen that have emerged from the pandemic? You know, certainly, I've, I mean, a lot of systems have done some fantastic work. And one of the big one is retail systems for the most part. If they weren't already in e-commerce, they very quickly pivoted to e-commerce or pivoted to, to curbside. Uh, curbside pickup and de- or, or delivery of, of products, and on the on the largest scale, I mean, I, I think you know certainly my my own personal experience, you know, Canadian Tire is a franchise system, and you know they very quickly moved uh, really up their game from a, from an e-commerce standpoint. Um, they went to curbside, and, and some of those changes they've now announced are going to be made permanent. I've seen a lot of my smaller clients have done something very similar. I mean, thanks to you know, thanks to the good people at Shopify and, and, and similar platforms, uh, it is now possible for small businesses to, you know, to, to launch an e-commerce platform and to do delivery and to do curbside, and they can implement it as quickly and as successfully as, as any of the largest players. And so that's one of the things that I've been really gratified to see, right, is that the leaders in the industry, the people that we all admire and look to, they have done some fantastic things, but it's actually what everyone else has done as well, which is now that this technology has almost become democratized. And I think a lot of these changes are going to be permanent because once, you know, once, once franchisees realize that there's additional ways to serve customers, so there's a way to get closer to their customers and, you know, be there for them in, in a way that's convenient for them and encourages them to, you know, continue to buy local from their local franchisee. Uh, I, I think those changes will be permanent. What, what the challenge is going to be as we come out of COVID is as life starts to return to normal. And so people are still wanting delivery or still wanting curbside, but still want to go back in is that the, the economic model is going to change again. And at this point, we don't quite know how it's going to shake out. And I think some businesses are going to find that, that it may not be, it may not be right for them financially to be on the channel and to continue to do all of these things. So some of them will say, I, I went curbside. I, I went, I, uh, I went, I went curbside during the pandemic, but I'm now taking that off because people can come into my locations again. Uh, I think other, other systems will make that change just for one. Uh, we'll, we'll make that permanent because it makes sense. You know, it gives them an opportunity to be on the channel. And, and to some extent, I mean, all, all COVID has done is taken all of the, the, the big trends around commerce that we've seen uh, both you know, business to consumer and business to business commerce, all of those changes that we've seen brewing for more than a decade. Um, and all of those kind of those big picture developments like the importance of the cloud and online, 
And it just accelerated that, right? It just, it forced everyone to move at the drop of a hat. And suddenly every organization that previously had an excuse why they couldn't do it. Like, I can't do that until I upgrade my old backend accounting system because I don't have a way to plug this into that. Or I don't, I can't do that until I work out how to handle the inventory management piece uh, and the supply chain considerations. Or I can't do that until I understand what it's gonna look like from a, you know, a, from a P&L standpoint for the franchisees in terms of their profitability and their labor costs. You know, those were all great excuses not to do things. The pandemic just forced us to say that gets thrown out the window we're gonna to have to dive in and we'll figure it out as we go and now that we figured it out i think brands will actually probably be more confident of their ability to implement change going forward i just hope that this time they'll have more time they can be more considered they can and be a little more collaborative with their franchisees when they do it so what are some common lessons that both franchisors and franchisees have learned throughout the past year? Um, and you can also add in any lessons you've personally learned over the past year. You know, I, I mean, I'll start with the personal lessons that I've learned, which is, you know, when this, when this pandemic first happened, you know, I think everyone really had no idea what was going to come next. The first three weeks were, were very uh, stressful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a time for a moment at least where, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, Clark, you really picked a nice time to uh, basically go out and start your own business, you know, and, and leave the, the, the comfortable confines of working for, for McDonald's, because who knows, you're, are you going to have clients? Are clients going to be knocking on your door? And I think everyone faced that, right? With this sudden uncertainty of, I don't even know what tomorrow looks like. And I have no idea whether I'm going to be open, whether there's going to be customers who want me and need my services. And so having come through that, I've, I've learned that there's a certain amount of you, you know, to some extent you, you accept what you can't control. Yeah, I very quickly made the decision last year, as did most of my clients, right? Like you can't, you can't let that anxiety and the stress and the uncertainty, you know, paralyze you. Instead, you just have to say, well, what am I going to do? I mean, those clients who, who, who need me, you reach out to me and, and I'm there in your corner. And you reach out to me, even if you're in, under financial constraints, I'm still going to be in your corner. I'm not going to abandon anybody. I'm going to support everybody uh, who comes to my door. And, and very early on in the, in the process, you know, at, at Dale and Lessman, you know, we had conversations, especially since we have a lot of clients uh, and systems in the restaurant industry was how are we going to support restaurants? And, you know, we very quickly looked at how can we provide, I'm going to say pro bono legal services to uh, restaurateurs and restaurant systems that are suddenly dealing with a host of issues around how do I, you know, how do I downsize? How do I lay off my staff? How do I deal with landlords? How do I deal with suppliers who are banging on my door? And so the big lesson for me was, you know, again, put aside the stress. Don't, don't let the things that you can't control, you know, paralyze you with, with the fear and instead just, you know, go optimistically and kind of look, just look at what you can do and, and how you can help. And, and very quickly, you know, things started to not return to normal but they started to get back to a point where, you know, we realized this is going to be with us for a while. And so we're just going to kind of keep on doing what we can do. And I was so grateful that, you know, after the first two or three weeks where most of the phone calls that I got were, you know, I'm going to say very much panicked phone calls about how do I, how do I do something like shut down my business and, you know, temporarily lay off my people, which is the, the worst Thing that any business owner ever wants, you know, has to go through. Mm-hmm. Uh, suddenly it was like, well, now, now I want to do this. I want to do growth. How am I going to market this? How am I, can I, I need help with negotiating an IT contract because I'm going to now launch online. And, and then suddenly, you know, we were all working together and we were working towards positive goals and we were seeing that kind of change. And I, I think for me, that was the lesson of, of the pandemic was just trusting, trusting that as long as you remained optimistic and were focused on, you know, working hard and serving and helping the people around you, ultimately the rest of it takes care of itself. Yep. Totally agree. And um, especially now the CFA is doing a lot of learning events and it is possible to grow during the pandemic. I mean, it's not totally out the window, so it's good to have that optimism. No, that's good. And, and I'll, I'll add to that because, um, you know, the CFA has been one of the leading organizations mm-hmm. and industry associations out there providing viable services to members. Uh, I've been grateful for the opportunity to be a, uh, a presenter on some of CFA's webinars, but, uh, you know, so much credit goes to CFA from immediately pivoting 
Um, obviously, you know, last April we were supposed to have the the annual convention in uh, in Montreal, and that had to be canceled. And that was, you know, for those of us who have attended CFA conventions in years past, uh, you know, bitterly disappointing not to get the opportunity to get together in person. But mm-hmm. CFA did an amazing job, and the event staff did an amazing job of pivoting to this series of online, you know, online webinars. Uh, all of these resources, the, the daily uh, email blast that goes up from CFA, I read it when it comes into my inbox every single day. It is the single best piece, you know, consolidating all the information related, relating to COVID, all of the government programs that are available to help small businesses. You know, CFA has been an incredible resource to its members, and I've been incredibly proud to be a member of CFA and to be able to assist CFA in my own way, when possible, helping provide those, those uh, services to members. Great. It's good to hear. Um, So on that note, what keeps you optimistic and motivated during the pandemic? Is there anything in your personal or professional life that inspires you? What keeps me motivated is just, and this is the wonderful thing about the franchising industry. I've now been working in this space for 20 years. And, you know, not only do I find it incredibly satisfying to work with business owners and franchisors and franchisees, but it's the people, right? Like I, part of the reason why I have never wanted to leave the franchising space and planned my career around how do I stay connected to this industry that I, that I, that I love so much. And it really is about the people. It's the people who motivate me. It's the people who keep me optimistic. And, you know, whether it's the opportunity to, you know, to chat with you today and to, you know, participate in, in some of the CFAs, you know, webinars and speak with my clients, but I just get, really excited and charged up when I get an opportunity to, you know, talk to people about their issues and I get to, you know, share some, share some of my experience and expertise and maybe help them. I I served on the board of directors of the CFA for a number of years and, you know, getting that opportunity to work with, you know, shoulder to shoulder on the board with so many of the other great leaders uh, and learn about their franchise systems and learn about how they build culture in their organization. You know, that inspires me. And when I, you know, every time I talk to somebody and I hear a story from them, there's always some part of it that just rings true. And I kind of file that away in the back of my mind in terms of, well, that's another nugget. And, And hopefully one day I'll get to share that nugget with someone else because it makes me incredibly grateful what I get to share those nuggets of wisdom with other people. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm helping and, and making a difference for them. And I just get such a charge out of, out of learning. You know, I, I think if you're, if you're the kind of person who just, you're a people person and you love learning and you love, love working with people, then this is, there, there could not be a better industry to work in um, because it really is all about relationships. It's great to hear. So reflecting on your many years of experience with franchisors, what advice do you have on how franchisors and franchisees can create a healthy relationship with each other? Well, I think it all, it, it, it comes back to communication, collaboration. Franchise systems by their very nature are, are democracies. Uh, and they're not democracies because everyone's, uh, everyone's vote matters the same amount. Uh, at the end of the day, franchisees have joined a system because they trust the leadership of the franchisor and they trust in the franchisor's ability to see the future and to come up with you know, innovations that are going to build a successful system and build successful businesses. But no one joins a franchise system and becomes a franchisee and invests their life savings you know, to simply be told what to do. These, these are entrepreneurs. These are people who themselves are passionate business owners who care about their communities and care about their people. And so communication and collaboration will always be the cornerstone of any great franchise system and the ability to make sure that you're listening. And there's incredible stories about the innovations that are driven by franchisees. I mean, the franchisees are the ones who are on the ground uh, dealing with clients and customers and some of the very best innovations actually bubble up from franchisees themselves. They aren't necessarily from a top-down approach. And, and my point would be, unless you have good communication and collaboration, and, and, and again, I'd, I'd come back to the importance of uh, franchisee advisory councils. I mean, that, that's having that kind of formal mechanism is, is so important. It's key to ensuring that ideas are bubbling up and that good communication is, is, is coming, you know, coming down from the franchise or to the franchisees. Um, if you can master that, then you can handle anything. You can handle a pandemic. You can handle incredible changes in the business, the obsolescence of products. There is no, you know, there's nothing that Mother Nature or the or the vagaries of the market can throw out a franchise system that a strong franchise system can't overcome if they have collaboration and communication. Great. 
So that was the end of my questions. Is there anything you wanted to add? The last thing I would add is, I mean, I'm going to assume that almost everyone listening to this is a CFA member, but for those of you who are listening to this podcast who aren't yet a CFA member, please join. This is the best industry organization. It is the best money that any franchisor can spend on behalf of the franchise system. The resources that CFA make available to uh, franchisors and their franchisees is incredible. The, and whether we're talking about lead generation for franchise uh, recruitment, whether we're talking about the network of suppliers that you have access to, or whether you're talking about the, the value of the advocacy that the government relations team at CFA puts together, you know, every franchisor is stronger by being part of this community and the community is stronger by having more members. So uh, please, if you're listening to this, uh, sign up right away. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Stephanie. It was such a pleasure. Thanks for listening. For more franchising resources, including how-to articles, expert advice, franchisee success stories, and franchise opportunities, visit franchisecanada.online. Don't forget to subscribe to Franchise Canada e-news while you're there. You can also learn more about franchising at cfa.ca and can connect to specific franchise opportunities at lookforfranchise.ca.